that message in song, I need to have a benediction. Would you say amen? It's the power of God to take what's broken, what's dead, and to resurrect and to take beauty out of the ashes. Love that song, thank you for sharing. And I must confess that as a father, I'm uh, thrilled to hear the kids singing and playing their instruments again. Uh, It's uh, exciting to be here with them. And uh, to hear all of that music being offered as an offering to our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, no matter where you are in the world, you come together with brothers and sisters on Sabbath, there is a bond. There is something that pulls us together. And though if you were to join me and Audrey in a church anywhere in China, you would say, well, this church looks a little different than what I'm used to at East Salem. You would still sense that you are part of a family. And the churches in China, almost without exception, in fact, I cannot think of an exception, every single church in China has a red cross here, Pastor Rick, right in the middle, big red cross. Not white, it's usually red, and then on each side, in every church, you will find the Ten Commandments. One table on this side and one table on the other side, that's all across China. But unlike unlike here, especially in the northeast of China where it gets very cold, you will also find a big pot belly stove right in the middle of the church. And you'll see a big, uh, you know, pipe taking the smoke out the side of the, and people bring their, their corn shucks and, and they feed it in there as uh, the church is going along to warm the church. But the biggest thing you will find in common is that We're all there to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I wanna thank you for the invitation and to be here as well as as the sense of belonging. Even though I'm not a member here, I am in Christ. This morning, we are here because it's Sabbath, but also because this is the special Easter time of year when we remember the power of God. And I'd like to start drawing your attention to to this power by talking to you about Mr. Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G. Mr. Zhang came to know Jesus when he was working as a security guard in one of the many, many state-owned enterprises before 19, in in around 1950, 1955. Mr. Zhang was addicted to Alcohol, Mr. Jung was uh, squandering his small family's every penny on gambling and, and other things. His family was almost to, at its end, his health was ruined. And into the middle of this difficulty came somebody who told him about Jesus and introduced him to the gospel the euangelion that we heard about in our offering call, the good news of Jesus Christ. And as a man flailing for his life in the open sea, he grabbed onto this lifesaver for life. And it changed his entire family. It changed the direction of his life. And he became a lifelong disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, to him... Jesus was not an idea, it wasn't a theology, not even a piece of history, it was somebody real, and from that day on, he referred to Jesus as his friend, Jesus. And so when he, a few months passed, and he came face to face with the communist party representative in the factory, letting him know that he needed to abandon this superstitious belief in his friend, Jesus, or else face the consequences, it was natural for Mr. Jiang to say, I'm sorry, I cannot abandon my friend Jesus. A few weeks later, his supervisor came and said, unless you work this coming Sabbath, this coming Saturday, Xin Xi Liu, then you will maybe lose your job. And Mr. Jiang did not bat an eye, and he said, on that day, my friend Jesus and I have a special date. I cannot work on his Sabbath. The week following, 
As he was sitting at home with his family, a knock came at the door, and not just his supervisor, not just the Communist Party director for that factory, but an entire cadre of people came into his home and for hours badgered him, saying, you've got to abandon this Jesus. You have got to abandon this Christ. You need to be a true party worker. He listened attentively and politely, but he said, I cannot abandon my friend Jesus. Step by step, he lost his job, and then one morning, the security police came and arrested him and put him in prison there in Shanghai, and within months, he was on a train headed to Qinghai province. It's the Siberia of China in western China next to Tibet, where he spent years upon years of forced labor, all because he would not give up on his friend Jesus. One time, one of the guards said, listen, unless you work this coming Sabbath, unless you give up the superstitions of Jesus, I am going to have to punish you. Well, this had happened many times. But this time, Mr. Zhang knew this guard who was extremely sadistic meant business. And sure enough, when he refused to work on his friend Jesus' special day, when he refused to give up his faith in Jesus, the man took him outside in the dead of winter. And if you know anything about Qinghai, this is extremely cold weather, tied him to a pole outside, stripped him naked, and left him there to freeze to death. I can't tell you the the whole story, but miraculously, an angel came and warmed him that night, and the next morning, he was found just sitting there singing songs. And if you've ever read the book, you're probably saying, I know that book, maybe I've read that book. It's called The Man Who Could Not Be Killed. Amazing story of Mr. Zhang. But from start to finish, there is a theme that says, I love Jesus, I cannot abandon my friend Jesus. Why could he suffer so much at the hand of persecutors? How is it that he could not give up his faith? How is it that he could year after year continue to hold on to this Jesus? Why was this man who lived 2,000 years ago, who claimed to be the Son of God, such a power in his life? What was it that drove him to these ends? One word, Jesus. And his power to save and to redeem. Let me pray. Father in heaven, this morning we want to focus on Jesus. Please speak through me. Please come through your powerful presence, your comfort of your Holy Spirit to touch every heart here. And though we have heard the name of Jesus and maybe we understand the gospel, we've heard it for many years, Lord, let us see Jesus freshly again today. And may we leave this place committed to the power of Christ in us unto salvation. We pray in your name, amen. Another man by the name of Paul went through much the same. You know, he expresses this in, in one of his epistles where he says that he was a man who was associated with Christ, who was a lifelong disciple of Christ, and because of that, he said that he was one who had been beaten, flogged, stoned. Remember that? Had to escape a, a, a city via a basket in order to save his life, one who was shipwrecked multiple times, one who was cast into dungeons, one who spent time in prison, one who, it goes on and on, all of this. And why did he do it? If you were to take all the writings of Paul and try to distill the mission that he had for his own life and the calling that he had in Jesus Christ, you will find it summarized there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. One thing, he says, is what drives him. One thing is what kept him on and on and suffering and suffering no matter what happened. One thing, and that is, he says, for I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. This was the power that drove him. This was his obsession. But why? 
There are many other great historical figures around the world. What is it about this man who lived 2,000 years ago that caused Mr. Jung, that caused Paul to suffer trial and finally his own death? It's because, as Paul said again in Romans 1.16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. It's powerful. It's powerful. And he had experienced it. Mr. Jung had experienced it. On that fateful weekend, which we call Easter weekend, we see the apex, you could say, of the plan of God to save man from his own sin and selfishness. The life and death and resurrection of Christ, says Paul, is the power of God. And you think that the power of God in creating the world was big. You think that the power of God in creating all that is living through a word was awesome and inconceivable. You haven't seen anything. That is nothing compared to the raw and unfettered power of God that was seen on a hillside garden there where Jesus, God incarnate, wrestled with evil and chose you over heaven. That is the power of God. Creation and even recreation at his second coming when he creates a new heaven and a new earth, they pale in comparison, I would suggest to you, They pale in comparison with the life-saving power of God on display on that hill we call Golgotha, where God chose agony, thirst, insults, asphyxiation, shame, and death so that he might save you and me. That is the power of God. I love the way Sister White puts it so clearly when she writes, who, by the way, also was a disciple of Jesus. She says, there is one great central truth to be kept ever before the mind in the searching of scriptures. She says, Christ and him crucified. Is there any ambiguity there? Are you unclear? She says, there is one great central truth, and that is Christ and him crucified. Paul said, if I come amongst you, whatever I preach, all I want to do is to preach Jesus. Because it is the power of God for your salvation and my salvation. And not only that, for the salvation of 1.4 billion Chinese. The salvation of the countless of others around the world. It is the power of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, Paul again comes around to describe and address this power of God. Unwrapping, I believe, its meaning more directly for you and me today. He says, for though he was crucified in weakness, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit in a minute. Paul says, though Jesus was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak to him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you and me. Can you say amen? Now, let's unpack this, because this is the theme of Paul's preaching. It is Jesus and the power of God. What is he saying here? Let me read it again. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. What is he saying? Well, it's why we are here today on this Easter weekend talking about Jesus. He is saying, Jesus gave up his God powers, gave up everything and became like a servant, the Bible says. He came totally weak and vulnerable so that he can save you and me. He gave up everything. And then he allowed himself to be beaten, 
degraded, abused, and finally killed. He made himself a spectacle of weakness, the definition of nothingness, so that the entire universe could see how empty he was. Weakness personified. A true lamb led to the butcher. He did all of that so that the story could continue. Because the story goes on to say that his willful weakness and sacrifice led to the clear power of God witnessed on the resurrection morning. Amen? The story does not end on Calvary. It does not end with the sealed tomb. The Easter story ends with the power of God on the resurrection morning. Life wins. Beauty comes out of the ashes, as the song said. And so here is what is amazing for you and me today and why we embrace and love Jesus so much, and that is this. In our weakness, listen carefully, this is the lesson that Paul embraced. This is the lesson for us today on this Easter weekend. In our weakness, he takes us into his arms and he accepts us. Just as we are mortal, imperfect, and yet in that state, he makes us part of his family. Loved by God and invested with this embryonic evidence of the power of God to salvation, which is in us through his Holy Spirit, the first fruits of the resurrection. I don't care how weak you might be. I don't care how many times you fell this last week. I don't care how you measure your faith in terms of its strength this very moment. That is exactly how the power of God accepts you in Jesus Christ. You might be discouraged on this Easter weekend. Maybe your heart is broken because of a loss in your life. Maybe you're uncertain about the very tomorrow that will come when the sun rises. It doesn't matter. Jesus was weak, but now he is strong. In Christ, you are powerful. In Christ, today, you have eternal life. In Christ, today, sin does not win, but life wins. Darkness does not reign, but light shines forth. That's what Paul is trying to say. Like Jesus, who was weak, and no doubt, we are weak now as well. The story does not end in the present weakness. It ends with the power of God on the resurrection day. Paul says, we shall live with him by the power of God. By the power of God. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved, and that is only the name of who? Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. The power of God on display on the cross and in the garden tomb. You know, we have a rich history as a church. This church has come about through a melding of many different faiths and people coming out of different denominations or out of coming out of unbelief into Christ. And it's wonderful. This church has been uh, conceived, you might say, by the dusting off of forgotten doctrines. And now we have what is now, and in the Pew Research uh, in a recent article said, is the fifth largest denomination, organized denomination in the world, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But you know what? Even though we are sure of our doctrine, and even though we know that we are living at the time of the end, the apocalyptic last chapter of Earth's history, and even though we understand that we have been called as a remnant to preach the three angels' message, and we might be able to tell you what the first, second, and third message is, sometimes, if you will allow me to be frank this morning, on this Easter morning, all of this theology, eschatology, pneumatology, and even archaeology cloud our soteriology. And soteriology, let me just put it this way. 
Our understanding of doctrines, our place in the parade of history can block the most important truth and that is Jesus Christ. It's the truth that ties everything together. That's what I mean by soteriology. It's what holds every single one of our doctrines together. And this is the person of Jesus Christ. We are Christians because we follow Christ, a person. His birth, his life, his suffering, his passion, his death on a rugged Judean cross, his brilliant resurrection and his ascension and his present ministry in the sanctuary above, all of this is the gospel that we are called to preach. It is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. In the book, Our High Calling, Ellen White puts it this way, Christ, his character and work is the center and circumference of all truth. He, speaking of Jesus, is the chain upon which the jewels of doctrine are linked. In him is found the complete system of truth. Can God's people say amen? In him is found the entire system of truth. He is the center and the circumference of everything that we believe. Take away Jesus and we have nothing. Take away Jesus, we have no hope. No Jesus, no resurrection. No Jesus, no eternal life. As Paul said, if Christ has not been risen, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Did you hear me, brothers and sisters? If you take away Christ, Paul says, everything is useless. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. If it's all just about these 70 years, then, man, people should have pity on us. But it's more than that because it's the power of God living in us that gives us the hope of eternal life and the present reality of eternal life living in us through the Holy Spirit. Three weeks ago, I was walking through one of the cities in China that you probably maybe never heard of. It's called Chongqing. And uh, Chongqing happens to be the municipality of Chongqing is actually the largest city, municipality, in all of China. It's not Beijing or Shanghai, but when you take all of Chongqing together, it has 30 million people. 30 million. In fact, only California as a state is bigger than that one city. And I was walking around, we were looking at this new church plant, new city church downtown Chongqing, and, and feeling inspired, but yet feeling completely overwhelmed. And I was talking with the pastor, and we were discussing the church, its history. He was telling me a tragic story of what happened during the Cultural Revolution with the pastors there and, and so forth. And then he said to me, Bob, you know that one of the early missionaries that came here from, from the United States, he got sick here in Chongqing. And he died, and he's buried here in Chongqing. Whenever I hear that, I want to say, can we go look at, can we go to the grave? I'd like just to pay my respects. And you know what he said? We don't know where his grave is. And if you go to Chongqing now, you see that it is just one solid mass of high rises. Everybody lives in these tall high rise apartment buildings and in other words, this faithful missionary who left his family, left everything that was common or comfortable or familiar to him, traveled to the other side of the world, and by, by the way, back then in the early 1900s, to get from Shanghai to Chongqing would take you two months, two months by ferry. And I've read some of those early stories of the missionaries. Oftentimes along the Yangtze and other tributaries, there were bandits that would shoot at, the, at them. And it was just, it was a nightmare. It was tremendously d dangerous. And here he goes, he makes a Chongqing, he begins to preach the gospel, he dies of sickness, he's buried, and now nobody even knows where he is. Nobody can put a wreath there. Nothing, he's completely forgotten. But you know what? Because of the power 
of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus knows exactly where he is. And I don't care how big the building is that's on top of him. It will not stand the power of the resurrection. I don't care how forgotten his name might be in history. He is written onto the palm of my Savior, Jesus Christ. He will be remembered. This is the power I'm talking about. You see, this is not a three-point sermon. This is a one-point sermon. Jesus. Jesus. He is the center and the circumference of everything that we are. How is it between you and Jesus right now? The most important question every day is, will you walk with Jesus today? Is he your friend? Does the power of God, the hope of Christ live in you? Or do you live in fear, uncertainty? Brothers and sisters, this morning, on this Easter weekend, know, know with certainty that Jesus lives. And not only that, that he lives to be your savior and that he wants to be your friend. Face what you may, challenge death, health challenges, financial setbacks. Brothers and sisters, Jesus lives and he is the power of God to salvation. How is it with you and Jesus? My prayer for you is found in this closing hymn that we will draw nearer to the cross of Christ every single day. Randy, could you come up and lead this, please? Hymn 312. That every day when we wake up, the first thing we will say is, I want to be near you today. Jesus, may your power live in my heart through the resurrection, through your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, by the time I get to bed tonight, may I be closer to you than I am right now. Jesus, draw me near to you. Hymn number 312, 312. Please stand. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. a trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me in the cross in the cross
soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting, shall find rest beyond the river. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you so much that while we were sinners, weak, lost, you came and died for us. Lord, we're still in a dark place, in a dark land. We still aren't back home with you. But yet, Lord, you are by our side. You live in us, and we are called your children. Lord, plant in us daily the hope of the resurrection. Give us daily the assurance of your presence. And may the light of Christ and the hope of his soon coming light our path. Dear Jesus, may we see you and walk with you every day. May you be our best friend, come what may, until we see you face to face. We pray in his name, amen.